was your thank God I looked at the contract moment? Story one was in a rental sublease at an apartment room where the tenants were trying to get me to pay for the months I was vacated if I could not find a replacement. I asked for a copy of the lease because the sublease had ended and they were citing the old lease rather than the new one. The tenants would not provide one, sending me the old lease. The property management wouldn't send me one, even after multiple requests from an answers emails immediately agent. Two days before the rent was due, the agent finally sends me the new lease after I send a stern email with legalese phrases. Turned out I wasn't even on the lease at all as subletter or tenant. And based on tenancy laws, I could just leave if I was vacated and gave notice. I gave two months notice. So I left. Story two. I signed up for a gym membership on a whim and got sketched out when they initially charged me 250 instead of only the 90 for the month. I went home and legit didn't sleep because I was so mad I went through with it. I called and asked the next day to see if I could cancel, and almost everyone I spoke to said either no, it was impossible, or only if I moved to an area that didn't have the gym. I checked the contract, and you could cancel within the first two weeks, and I was only three days into the contract. You bet your peach I canceled so fast. Edit Lifetime Fitnesses. Story 3. Was sent a freelance contract for a job offer in the media industry. I was a graduate at the time with two years' experience. Was offered £6.50 hourly pay and with the expectation that I must be available to work 37.5 hours per week. I had to use my own car for business purposes, but couldn't claim expenses for fuel mileage. And above all, the contract demanded full rights for the company to use any creative works I produced within two years before the start date of the position. I didn't accept the job. Story 4. I moved into my worst ever apartment complex. They had too small of a staff. The maintenance guys looked unprofessional and I was burglarized. When I was burglarized, the temporary person working the property from another apartment complex wasn't sensitive at all to me and asked me to provide my renter's insurance information to pay for the damage to the door and building. I don't think she knew how this works. Well, understand I was counting down the days until my lease was up. I submitted the required 45 days notice and found a better place to live. The property contacted me and told me they were happy to accept my notice and that I'd be out in June. This was March. Told them no, my lease was up April. They told me according to my lease, I still had two more months. I told them to show me. I had signed a 10-month lease, not a 12-month. They were certain the lease was 12 months, but they didn't produce the lease. They gave me a copy of their standard lease. I had to do some digging, but I found my copy of the lease I signed. 10 months. Definitely research management company's owners before moving into a property. Story 5. When I bought my car new three years ago, the finance department processed and had me sign paperwork at a certain price. Then they called me three days later and told me that their lender fell through, and I would actually have to pay an additional dollar one hundred a month. I brought in the paperwork with the price I signed for and the keys, told them they would stick to the contract or they could have their car back with the additional mileage. Apparently, this is a fairly common practice at car dealerships. Beware! Story 6. Toyota was going to give me a $750 college rebate and 1.9% APR for 60 months for my truck. Finance comes to talk saying I suddenly don't qualify for the rebate. And if I did take the rebate offer, I'd have a 5% APR rate and said to purchase the truck without the rebate at 3.5% APR. Luckily, I'm not stupid and looked through the rebate's fine print prior to walking in. I told them to show me where in the fine print where it said I would have to pay that interest rate and why. The guy said sure he would show me. Obviously couldn't find it. He walked away and came back and said, I actually do qualify for the rebate and low percent APR. So yeah, Richard, if you're reading this fudge, you. Story 7. I had taken some helicopter flying lessons and was considering switching careers to that. So I found a flight school and applied for a student loan. Fannie Mae was the only one that would cover it. And when I got the final paperwork, the interest rate was higher than they told me over the phone. And the total payment to them was going to be well over $200,000. So I canceled and didn't go to flight school. Edit. Sorry, everybody, I meant Sally Mae. Story 8. At my high school, they set up Wi-Fi for us to use. However, in the terms of service, it said that by signing into the network, the school had permission to search the phone and look at its contents. I did not sign in and have not to this day. Edit. Wow, this is by far the most popular post I've ever made. Popular enough that now we have some actual legal experts here. Thanks, everybody. Story 9. My wife and I were at a car dealership buying our first car. The dealership was offering special no-interest financing for recent college grads, and we were using that to finance the car. The finance guy presented us with two options, a three-year payment plan and a five-year payment plan. The whole time he made it sound like the zero interest applied to both, and so we went for the five-year plan to get a lower payment. Finance guy tries to get us to sign without reading the paperwork, but we weren't having that. 
Come to find out the longer payment plan didn't qualify for the no interest deal and we were getting charged 6.5%, which is a hell of a lot more than zero. We got pissy and threatened to walk out after we realized what they were trying to pull and got them to come down on the price. I know they've pulled that on other recent grads who don't read the paperwork and just sign. Story 10, bit long but satisfying to me at least, was leasing with a big apartment company where I had a garage along with my apartment. The lease contracts they cook up are 20 plus pages long and naturally slanted heavily in their favor, and they use them as clubs against their tenants. Generally scummy behavior all around, they removed the restricted access gates because they were tired of maintaining them and kept advertising it anyway, etc. So the contract comes up for renewal, and they of course raise the rent on both the apartment and the garage, counting on inertia to keep me there, even though they're blatantly advertising a lower rate on the same model for new leases. Now at this point, I'm planning on leaving in a year anyway to buy my house, so I swallow it and tell them to write up the contract for me to review. I sit down and read the thing, and notice they've clearly left the garage fee off the contract, even though it's noted as being leased. I bite my tongue and read it over, and yes, according to the paperwork, the sum total of everything was the price of just the apartment, and the total is less than what I paid the previous year. I sign it, fully expecting to hear back that they made a mistake before the property manager countersigns it. A few days later, I get my fully executed contract on my doorstep. Now the fun begins. I wait until the bill shows up on their payment website and call them up saying, there seems to be some mistake. You're charging me dollar X when my lease is for dollar Y. Please correct, they tell me they'll review. A couple days later, they call to say, oh, it's just a mistake in the paperwork. You can either pay the full amount or we can take the garage off your lease. Oh, no, no, no. My contract clearly states the apartment and the garage is this price. Please correct your billing. I paid them the amount owed per the contract on the first. Now come the threats. Eviction. Delinquent payment. Going to affect credit. Corporate lawyers. Luckily, I have prepaid legal services through my work. I call up the lawyer they refer me to and send off the contract. He calls me back the next day and says, You're absolutely right. They don't have a leg to stand on here. Get their attorney to provide you in writing what they believe their legal basis is for demanding more than what's in the contract, and I'll take care of it. My favorite line in contracts like this is how they clearly state that it is the entirety of the agreement, so there's no chance of slipping in things on either side. The property manager calls me to come visit her in the office the same day and says she reviewed it with their attorney, and he believes they're in the right because of generally advertised pricing or some other such nonsense. She also implied that the person who wrote the contract was in danger of losing their job because of the issue, as if she wasn't more liable for it for signing off on it. This is where I get to tell her I've also retained legal services and passed on what he said. The look on her face was priceless. She told me she'd take it back to them. End of the story, I received a very terse note dropped on my doorstep a day later saying they've removed the extra charge from my account. I'm happily living in my new house for four years now, but that still gives me a warm glow when I remember it. Edit. I live in a high cost of living area, so that detached one car garage would have cost me $1,800 for the year. Not surprisingly, nobody was fired for the contract screw up. Story 11. Landlord agreed to let me move out a month early since he wanted to lease the apartment to someone else. We had to sign new paperwork to let me out of the original lease and to make me agree to be out by an earlier date. I knew he was a recently convicted forger, so I made sure to read what I was signing. He'd added the condition that if anything fell through with the new tenant that I would still be on the hook for rent after I moved out. I called him out on it and he said, oh yeah, I just added that part to protect myself. Then he stole my deposit. I still need to take him to court for that. Fudge you, John. Edit. Okay, you all convinced me. I've got a few more months before the statute of limitations is up. Just left him one final voicemail and we'll proceed with the civil case if I don't get my check by the end of this week. Story 12. We were in the process of selling our business. My wife's car was registered under business. We sat down with our lawyer to discuss what is included in the sale, equipment, supplies, etc., and we clearly told him the car is not included in the sale. Well, guess what we received the typed-up contract from our lawyer, and he had added the car along with other things. Thank God we read it and had it removed before signing it and sending to buyer's lawyer. Story 13. Mine wasn't really extreme, but my GF and I were shopping for houses, and we were checking out a townhouse-style condominium. The price was within our budget, and the monthly maintenance fees were average for the area. It was an open house event hosted by a retailer, so the property's annual expenses were included in a pamphlet. I found that on top of the regular monthly maintenance fees, around $350, there was an additional expense of $800 every six months. 
I asked why there was an additional expense if there were already regular fees. She responded that the extra $1,600 per year was used to keep the fees low. I responded that the fees are average for the area and many places in the same neighborhood are already lower. Long story short, it was a nice house, but we didn't pursue it further. I'm on board with the idea of condo fees if they cover things that I would normally pay for like heat water, snow removal, garden care, etc. And if needed additional expenses for major upgrades like new roofs or doors windows. But expecting 12 houses in the row complex to each kick in a 1600 bonus every year without specific accountability isn't something that interests me. Story 14. First time renter here? Moved out of Unirest to get my own place so I could take my family cat. Found a nice little apartment for cheap downtown. Intended to move in with a roommate or two to split the cost. Close friends of the landlord didn't speak English very well. So although he insisted, oh yeah, everything good, everything okay, I wasn't sure he understood what I wanted. When he brought out the contract, it said in writing that pets were not allowed and the cost would increase for more people living there. I pointed it out to him, but he retorted to the effect of, I use this contract for all tenants. Those rules don't apply to you, bull. I told him I wasn't signing unless he rewrote the contract, but he refused, saying he wasn't going to waste time pandering to paranoid people. I offered to write the contract myself and was baffled that he agreed to it. So I wrote up my own contract with super lenient conditions, making sure to protect my own peach. Had a lawyer look at it and notarize it, and now I live with my cat and roommates at the original cost. Story 15. Had company I worked for bought by another. The handover included new contracts for all staff with the new owners. I went through every word, and glad I did, as one clause gave the new owners rights over any IP I had ever had. E.g., if I had a patent from before I even worked for the previous company, I was signing away all rights to it to the new owners without any compensation. This included if they ever moved into a new area of business. So if I suddenly got successful in another field outside of work time and nothing to do with their business, they were allowed to just start a new field of endeavor and take everything from me. I'm extra glad I did check because they later proved to be deceitful and dishonest. Kept on changing our salary payments, super contributions, accidentally forgetting to pay us, all sorts of stupid stuff. Story 16. Buying my house. Husband signed the paperwork and I went in later that day to sign. I started to read through the loan application. Mortgage lender said, what are you doing? You don't have to read it. Your husband already signed it. I was like, no, I want to make sure it is what I want. Loan was a $250,000 at 25%. Yeah, right. Didn't sign it and got out of there. Mortgage guy said he was going to take me to court. I said, go ahead. It would be cheaper than what he wanted me to sign. Took over all the mortgage stuff from then on. Mortgage guy was a friend of a high school friend of my husband. Edit. Just talk to my husband. The man who tried to sell us on this mortgage got busted and arrested. Lost everything and had to have his parents bail him out. Also, the mortgage lender we did go through for our FHA loan. He also got arrested for selling bad loans. Do your research. Story 17. I moved to Southeast Asia to work as a teacher. In the contract that they originally emailed me, they offered $1,000 to cover my moving costs. Really, that was just barely more than my one-way ticket. But at least I wouldn't lose money. When I arrived, they gave me a copy of the contract to officially sign. But I noticed that there were fewer total enumerated points on that contract than on the one emailed to me. I looked more closely and they had removed the provision for $1,000 moving costs. I know Southeast Asian culture, so I knew blowing up wouldn't get me anywhere. I played it off as a mistake, and calmly insisted on signing a printed-off version of the one emailed to me. I got that $1,000, but thank goodness I read the contract again. Story 18. We were getting ready to move from the U.S. Midwest to one of the U.S. island territories back in 2000. We had five cell phones that I was going to have to cancel, and I was looking at some hefty cancellation fees. Then I remembered a clause, not in the contract, but that was printed on our bill a month or two earlier. Previously, they had not charged per-minute rates for calls if they were automatically forwarded from the cell number to another number. I had mine set up to transfer to my landline. The notice had two important points. First, they would now charge for the duration of the call, even if it was forwarded. Second, if I didn't agree to those terms, I could terminate the contract with no penalties. Remembering that I saw that saved me almost $1,000 in termination fees, I was prepared for a hassle when I contacted them, but the termination went smoothly. Story 19. When I finished high school, I had to have a gap year and earn $26K in 12 months to be declared as independent in order to get off study, government pays you to study, and move to university. Got a 12-month job and read the contract extensively because I needed to be making at least $500 a week. Job was paying $550 a week, so signed the contract and went to work. My first pay slip was $310. Mind you, this was tarring roads for 40-plus hours a week, so this was taxing work for so little money. 
demanded for six months to get a copy of my contract, but the traineeship agency wasn't responding. Had to do extra work on the weekends at Subway to get my weekly earnings up. Eventually, the general manager called me and set up a meeting with me, said this was a fudge up and they'll back pay me and start paying me what I signed up for. People got fired for letting it go for so long. Story 20. Musician type person here. Label wanted to sign me. The entire contract was in very, very broken English. Amongst the idiocy on the contract were such gems as signing over my name, copyrights to all of my past songs, and being held accountable financially for any physical albums that didn't get sold. Edit. A couple have people have asked, so I'll leave my Bandcamp link here. It's industrial and incredibly noisy at times, so be prepared. Story 21. I went to a reasonably well-advertised jewelry store to pick up an engagement ring. Knowing that I wanted to to be a surprise, and that she would want to pick out her own ring in due time, I made sure that the ring would be returnable for full price, and even for a full refund from that store when I bought it for about $900. After the proposal, my then fiancé found a ring she liked better at a different jeweler, so I went to return the ring. When I said I wanted to return the ring, the clerk said, No problem, just sign this and we'll get you sorted out. I read the small paper and it stated something very close to, I now confirm the sale to be a final sale and cannot be refunded or returned for any reason. I read it, pen in hand, looked at her and said, why would I sign that? She took the slip back, got her manager, and I was able to get the full amount returned via the same way I paid, on my debit card. For those interested, it was a people's jewelers in Vancouver. Story 22. Two years ago, I went to buy a used car. I really liked it. Tess drove it twice and went in for the paperwork. They ran the numbers and gave me the paperwork to review. I busted out my phone and started doing the math on it using one of those websites that calculates auto financing and interest for you. I did the math with the website and on my own three separate times while they stared me down. The numbers didn't add up. Turns out, they had it set up that payments wouldn't officially kick in until 60 months, but would still be accruing interest that entire time. Screw that. That. And the fact that I caught the salesman lying to me on all kinds of things like, this unused space behind the engine is specifically. So if you're in a crash, there will be room for it so it won't hit you. Hmm. No, jackass. It's a low-end model with a tiny engine. Don't try and sell this as a safety feature. Ugh. Anyways, walked out from them and got a lot of passive-aggressive and even threatening texts in the following days. Screw them. Story 23. Looked at renting a house about seven years ago, and the homeowner had inserted some of her own clauses into the standard tenancy agreement. Now, this is absolutely fine to do but they were purposefully put into different sections of the document. So if you read the part detailing security deposit, you wouldn't see her additions as she put them in another area on the paperwork. One clause was that no footwear underscore of any kind underscore can be worn inside the property. Failure to adhere to this will mean the whole property's carpeting must be professionally cleaned. Another was the waiving of the mandatory notice period before the homeowner can come by and inspect the property. There's supposed to be a minimum amount of time they must give you notice-wise before they can come over, unless there is a serious property fault, leak, etc., so that they can't just turn up unannounced. She wanted that waived so she could check we were treating her property right, and if we weren't, then we'd be underscore immediately underscore evicted. I also caught her telling a relative that she registers eviction proceedings upon the start of the tenancy, so she can evict them as soon as she decides they've broken her rule. There was a mandatory waiting period between commencement of eviction proceedings and being able to actually get enforcement officers to evict a tenant. Not sure of the current rules on this anymore, as I don't have as much to do with rental properties now. Noped out of that house really quickly and got a much bigger, cheaper house, albeit more of a death trap, a few streets away. Story 24. I just bought a used car and my wife and I had to bring our newborn. She hadn't pooped all day, and I knew from her doing it the day earlier that a monster cow was brewing. Well, it happened in the finance office, and she cow all over me. Now, just before this, we talked about the $250 cancellation option, how I didn't want it, how I sold cars in my past. We had a good conversation about it. Well, this jabroni gave my wife a digital paper to sign to reject it and zooms in to help her sign, but is really obscuring the fact he had her sign for it. After I emerged from the bathroom, Covered in watered-down cow, I read the whole long form and caught it. He pretended not to know what the charge was, then he said it will take wires to manually redo. I told him to get to it. It didn't take hours. I didn't know about the signature until after I got home because he gave me a digital copy of that on a USB drive. When I got home and looked over the digital part of the contract, I was floored to see and put together what happened. This asshat saw us struggling with our new baby and thought he could steal $250 from us to pad the back end. Story 25. Put a $1.20k deposit on a house 
when we went to meet with the kitchen's subcontractor to pick her appliances, he told us he couldn't order them until he got paid by the contractor for back dollar dollar owed. Turns out the contractor couldn't pay his bills. When I went to the real estate agency that we bought through, looking for my deposit back, they told me the contractor had the cash. There was nothing I could do. I was not happy. So I started digging a bit and watching the house and the listings. Within a week, they had another deposit on the house. What I learned from my digging was this. It's extremely illegal to take and hold two deposits on the same property. Armed with this knowledge, I paid another visit to the real estate agency and told them they just violated the law and their choice was get me my money or deal with the cops and every legal agency involved in real estate regulations in the state. Had my money back two days later, but only after telling the contractor no to a personal check. Story 26. Recently, I just started a new job and the employee agreement said I wasn't eligible for overtime. But it was something I 100% confirmed I was eligible for, and it was in my job offer letter. I pointed it out on the spot and HR crossed it out and initialed it. She claimed she must have grabbed the wrong agreement by mistake. I hope there wasn't anything else in the agreement that didn't pertain to me. It did have a forced arbitration clause that I'm still unhappy about, but this job is just a stepping stone for me. Story 27. We bought a new RV and received a coupon for three free nights at a luxury RV campground park. Of course, to receive the free nights, we had to sit down with salespeople trying to sell us a membership first. My ex was very gullible and gobbled up the free cookies and sales pitch after they showed us the beautiful photos of their campgrounds all over the state. There were many promises made of ocean views, clubhouses, swimming pools, etc. I was young, and he was definitely the one in charge at the time, so next thing I know, the three free nights turns into a full-blown membership with extremely pricey annual fees. But now we can camp anywhere, anytime, right? We head out that weekend to the dedicated property for the free nights, and it's an absolute cow hole. There is no ocean view. The pool is covered in scum. The clubhouse has the smell of a mismanaged senior home with three residents staring at us oddly. Basically, it's a gravel-lined trailer park for people who live in their RVs. I'm pissed. The kids are sad and trying to play on the rusty swing set. We bailed out that night after driving three hours, and the next morning he tried to cancel. They had told us we could cancel any time. Yeah, right? After rereading the contract, this was a lifetime membership, and you could not cancel it without following their exact fine print instructions of cancellation via certified mail written in the blood of your firstborn. It also had to be done within 48 hours of signing. These assholes send people away for three days to a dump, so when you come back, you're contracted for life like a timeshare. Lucky for us, my bad person fit got us home within 24 hours, wrote up their ridiculous demands for cancellation, and booyah head right out of there. Then they tried to not refund us despite it all, and I threatened them with litigation, so they finally did. I have a scathing Yelp review about them that gets regular votes for being useful and funny. They recently tried to get it removed and failed. Suck it, you dirty rotten leashes. Story 28. Moving out of a house we rented in Texas some years ago. Got a letter saying I won't be receiving my deposit back due to having to pay for the AC coil to be cleaned. A C worked fine when we moved out, and I thought it sounded like nonsense. I went into their office and asked for a copy of rental agreement contract. I then sat down and read through the entire thing and went back to the front desk, pretty large rental agency, and asked them to show me where in my contract does it state that I'm responsible for the AC coil cleaning or any property maintenance for that matter. First guy couldn't find it. Second guy couldn't find it. I asked to speak with the owner manager and asked him the same thing. He said, oh sure, it's right. Her, no, here no. Hmm. I told him I wasn't leaving until I had a check in my hands for the full amount of my deposit. And sure enough, 30 minutes later, I was on my way out. I was active military at the time and apparently the lawyers they appoint for servicemen are pretty badass. But I never had to threaten a lawyer or mention that I was active duty military at the time. Story 29. I went to sign up at Snap Fitness, and it said they'd charge a $50 gym enhancement fee every year. They said it would go to equipment upgrades. I told them that's what my monthly fees should be going to. They refused to remove the fee, so I bailed and went to Anytime Fitness. They immediately proceeded to pull the same cow, plus the key fob to get in was going to cost me $70. You can buy a pack of 100 of them for like $1.20 on Amazon. They too refused to budge, so I backed out. Eventually, I moved to an apartment with an on-site gym, so that worked out for the better. Story 30. I moved to Chicago a couple of years back. Within the first couple of months I was there, I got hammered with three expensive tickets, totaling $800, I think, all within one afternoon for parking in a school zone. It was the summer. I was new to the neighborhood, and the sign was pretty tough to read, but it seemed like I was in the wrong and probably wouldn't be successful if I tried to fight it. 
So I start looking into my payment options and learn about a payment plan program that the city was unveiling to help folks under financial hardship pay off their tickets. Though I wasn't totally destitute by any means, I had just moved to the city to start a PhD program, and I didn't really have that kind of money just lying around. So I figure that I'll check this program out. As I'm reading up on the program, I read the fine print and learned that in order to enroll in it, you need to default on your ticket, as which causes your fee to double. Then you have to pay that new total in monthly installments. Had to scrounge up the cash to pay the tickets off, which wasn't easy, but I was very happy that I did my HW. For a program that was sold as this progressive policy to help struggling folks out to have such a messed up clause in their fine print is downright predatory. I love Chicago, but Rahm Emanuel can seriously go fudge himself. Story 31. Viewed this great flat and was ready to hand over a deposit when I decided that I should actually read the rules they sent me once over again. I had read the one they gave me when I viewed the place, and it was a bit strict. And in general, I thought it was silly to have written rules when you're paying that much. But again, nothing I couldn't handle. Thank Odin I checked. The rules listed in the email were completely different and included gems like, if you wish to bring a guest to the house, you must put forth a request in writing at least one week prior and must be approved by all members of the flat. There will be no guests allowed after 10 p.m., absolutely no guests staying over. Any guest that comes over will require a $20 fee to go towards water usage for toilets. I'm like, you want me to pay over $1,000 a month for my own private room and not be able to invite people to come over without jumping through ridiculous hoops? Noped out real quick. There were a few other ridiculous things, but that took the buns. Story 32. U.S. Marines. I was enlisting for a program that's five years of active duty, age 19. Get the contract and it says eight years. Nobody had ever mentioned anything about that. I ask and the recruiters point out that it's an overall eight-year contract, but only five active, and the other three years I can serve in the reserves or in the inactive ready reserve. They explained that IRR means you still are eligible for service on paper, but have no monthly or annual obligation except keeping your address updated. And that all it means is, if World War III breaks out and they're drafting guys anyway, you'll come back in at your old occupation and rank. So I signed. Note this was pre-9-11 when we had no major wars going on. 9-11 happens. I do two tours in Iraq while on active duty. And six months before my eight years is up, I get involuntarily recalled and sent to Afghanistan for six months. Story 33. When I was in high school, I bought some subwoofers for my car that came in a pre-made box. I was an idiot and didn't think to take into account the size of the box in addition to the 16-inch subwoofers when measuring my trunk to see if they would fit. Well, surprise, surprise, they did not fit, and I had to take them back to Circuit City for a refund. I was in high school at the time and literally had just had a class a few weeks ago in which my teacher told us to always, always, always read a full contract before we sign it. Fortunately, that lecture resonated in my mind when they handed me a piece of paper at the return desk in order to process my return. It was a singular piece of paper, and on it, they said that by signing this paper, you agree to have a restocking fee deducted from your refund. I asked them how much the restocking fee would be, and they told me it would be something like $90 when the entire purchase was only $200, Christmas time sale. I told them to fudge off in a very polite way and ended up selling them, as well as my amp on Craigslist, for only a very minor loss. Also, remember Western Sky Loans? They ceased operations in 2013 because they were charging exorbitant rates for loans, even by payday company standards. A $10,000 loan from that would end up costing you $62,000 in the long run. Always read the fine print, people. Always. Story 34. My husband, then fiancé, was getting ready to buy a used car that's often used for street rally. He doesn't do that, but it's a oh-no-fun car to drive, and is pretty much sure to have aftermarket modifications if it's been owned by someone who used it for or as a status symbol. My husband had done his research, and neither of us were going to be taken for a ride, and even though this was the car we absolutely wanted, we were prepared to walk away. It was fairly low mileage. The dealer, a third-party outfit, not a brand dealership, kept swearing up and down that the car was still under manufacturer's warranty and had no aftermarket mods. I was skeptical. I knew that if the car had any aftermarket mods, the warranty would be void for that portion of the car, if not the whole thing, depending on the extent of the influence of the mods. I read every piece of paperwork they wanted my husband to sign and explained them to him, but I couldn't find anything that guaranteed that the car was still under manufacturer's warranty. So I straight up told him to walk away from the deal unless they gave us a piece of paper that both parties signed that said exactly that. They did it. Lo and behold, the car had an aftermarket downpipe, a really nice one, that had been installed improperly. 
Huh? It was affecting the airflow through the engine and could have eventually caused permanent damage to the engine. It was going to cost us hundreds of dollars to either have it reinstalled properly or return the engine to its original unmodified state, which would give us warranty compliance. Yai. But surprise, assholes! We had a piece of paper that gave us a hold on their balls. They tried to avoid us for a week or so until we left them a voicemail saying that if we didn't hear from them in 24 hours, they'd be hearing from our lawyer. And that's how we didn't pay for having the car restored to warranty specs. We even got to keep the downpipe. It's kind of spiffy. Edit. The car is a Mazda Speed 3. Story 35. My wife and I were three days away from signing paperwork to buy a condo, and they sent us the latest. And we noticed that they changed the interest rate by a tiny amount, like 0.2%. They said the change was because they or ran our credit, so they altered the interest to reflect our current credit rating. That left a bad taste in our mouth, so we said no thanks and walked away. The next week, my company got bought out and they moved us out of state. If we would have signed, we would have had to either immediately sell or quit my job. Story 36. Joined the Army National Guard right out of HS and was eligible for a 20K bonus lump sum for the job I picked, as it was stated in my contract. Recruiter told me that wasn't the case. I would receive the first half after completing all initial entry training and the other after three wires of service. I double-checked and verified and brought the some bad person to him. To his surprise, he didn't believe anyone, an 18-year-old, would read their contracts. Story 37. Was starting a new job and expected a pretty straightforward contract of employment. However, I knew that with these things, I have to read it with a fine tooth comb. Now for context, most jobs in the UK, where I am, offer 25 days of annual leave per year. My contract, however, said just 20. As I'd never had a job that didn't offer 25 days, I pushed back on it by asking if this was legal not to my new employer, but to the recruiter. Got a response back 10 minutes later that the company's offering me 25 days holiday and I took it. Sometime later when I'm at this new firm, I was discussing holidays with another guy who joined roughly the same time as me, and he only had 20 days of holiday, despite us being at a very similar level in terms of seniority and experience. He was kicking himself for not pushing back on this point. Story 38. I finally have a story for one of these posts. Woohoo, doing my apprenticeship whilst at college was initially an 18-month course at college. Not normal college, but three days on-site training at oil lamp gas training and two days in college. Got to the final month and the training apprenticeship scheme company said they were changing the course and adding another two months on for additional courses for us to have additional qualifications. No worries, right? Good for us? Yeah. They kept saying they would bring in new contracts this week, brought in part of paperwork that stated we agreed to all terms and conditions in the new contract, but they somehow forgot the new contract. All my college mates were away to sign. I, being the smart one, told them to hold off until we read the contract. Managers tried to nonsense us, saying that nothing changed, etc., etc., blah, blah. I stood my ground, and they brought contract in three days later. I read it, and three new things had been added. One, any days off from now will constitute gross misconduct, and you get flung off course straight away. Two, you agree to pay all training costs if you leave course at all during final two months. Three, they will not now guarantee you a job placement for the final two years of your apprenticeship offshore. No one signed, refused to do any work. Had to get the CEO of company involved to change it back to original and to guarantee us all job placements for final two years. Thank God I read that or about 40% of my class would have been thrown off for days off. Story 39. There's this website where everything was free, just pay shipping. All high-end looking cow. I went to the terms conditions and read it. No matter how much you put in your cart, they pick one item at random and that's what you get. They also can't guarantee that what the picture shows is what it is. They can also decide not to send you anything. I nope right out. If it's too good to be true, it is. Story 40. I'm a professional actor. Last summer, I auditioned for the local Ren Fair, not realizing that it wasn't a paid gig. Found out a week into the rehearsal process. Oh, well, I thought to myself. I agreed to this. I should have done better research. So about a month and a half later, the contracts come out. They're standard stuff for the most part. We won't hold the fair accountable if we get injured. We acknowledge we represent the company and thus won't do X, X, E, and Z unprofessional things during fair hours, etc., etc. But buried in the middle of the contract is a non-compete clause, which basically forbade the signer from working for any other Ren Fair or Halloween event within 100 miles for a full year. The other folks at the fair were a lot less concerned about it, but I was absolutely not okay with that. They weren't paying me, and I wasn't going to sign off to not make money in a part of the industry for a solid year. I bailed basically as soon as the contracts were given to us. Story 41. Not sure if this counts, but Spectrum, like most big telecom, sent me an email saying that they are increasing by bill by dollar 10 MO. 
When I called in, they tried to convince me I was on a promotional period, which I was not since I was already a customer of three years and read to them my bill and customer agreement with dates. After explaining to them that they are indeed lying to me and being transferred around to three people within cancellations, they miraculously found a way to reduce my bill by $1.15 going forward. Even though they backed down, it makes me sad to think about those who aren't apt enough, like my grandparents, to notice these money grabs and how much money these companies make by pulling this cow. Story 42. A couple years ago, my husband and I were looking to replace his car after an accident totaled it. We went to a dealership in New Orleans to test drive a specific car that we had checked out ahead of time. Even printed out the dealer's listing from their website so we could nail down the price we wanted. We got to the dealership and were immediately scooped up by their top man who had another sale going on at the same time. We handed him the listing and said it was the only one we wanted to see. He said sure and would have one of the training salespeople pull the car for us. The girl came and found us with the key. We checked it out and husband loved it. We got to the signing table and the price went from $13K to $16K. I asked to see the complete contract before we signed anything. It was the wrong freaking car. We were looking for a 2013 base model with less than 60K miles. They tried to sell us a 2010 luxury model with almost 230K miles. The top man came back just in time for the sale and tried to blame it all on the trainee. After a very heated discussion with top man about now taking our business elsewhere since he tried to screw us, dealership owner graced us with his presence and said the one we were there to see was on loaner and they thought we would like this one better anyway. After even more arguing, we left and found a cheaper version of the luxury model in Slidell with only 80K miles for very near our price point. Story 43. Okay, this is just a piece of advice because I know there are actors out there who want to get into the business. I'm a talent agent and entertainment lawyer. I cannot tell you how many contracts I read that include things that are not enforceable by law or are just plain illegal, but actors are so happy to get an agent they sign without looking. Hire a ing lawyer. I used to charge $100 to read a contract when I still did it. It's worth it. Example, I had a client, let's call her Jess. Jess is an incredible talent in voiceover. She, to this day, is one of my best clients, however. When Jess was first starting about eight years ago, she signed a contract with an agency out of Kansas City. Two years later, she left the agency and we picked her up and showed her our contract. She raised her eyebrows at our rates asking, how do you guys make anything with such low commission rates? This along with a few other things made me ask if she had a copy of her old contract for me to read. So here we go. First, it stated that the agency's commission rate, percentage of actor earnings they get, was 45%. The industry standard? If your union, it can legally be no higher than 10% and are usually never goes higher than 15% even for new talent that non-union. Second, it stated a non-compete clause that lasted for three years and covered the entire U.S. and Canada. Not enforceable, and if I'm being honest, I could make a judge throw that out on a dime, but it would cost you a lot of money for me to do. Usually, you don't find non-compete clauses in acting agencies other than a penalty for breaking your contract with us early, which in our agency, we usually derive from an average of your earnings during the course of the current contract. Third, and this was a fun one, said that she could not deny appearing provided proper compensation. I was tempted to hammer this flipping company after reading this. Jess was a very attractive woman, but that changes nothing. Let me be clear to all actors, you have every right to deny a job for any reason you choose. If your agency pushes you into something against your own choice, you call a lawyer or your union rep if you have one. There were about five other stupid things about ownership and her responsibilities, but those are the main ones. Nothing makes me more sick than agencies taking advantage of kids pursuing their dreams. They are flipping old age snake oil salesmen who only survive off the desperation of people who have dreams. Being an actor is tough and your agent is supposed to be on your side. It's an unwritten rule of the profession that unless there are extreme circumstances, you hold the line with your client. That's literally the rules in my agency and I've fired people for flipping over actors for their own gain. I could go all day, but please, if you're ever in a situation as an actor or performer where there is a contract, just hire a lawyer to consult and have them read it. It doesn't cost much in the grand scale of what you could lose, and they will always help you because if you're happy, then you'll come back if you need them. Edit. You type one post without your coffee, and Detective Reddit starts screaming from the rooftops. I fix the post you. Story 44. A bit of a different take on the question. TLD DAR. Make others present you with proof you agreed to a contract before blindly accepting their assertion that you had one with them. My wife worked for a community college as a faculty assistant professor for the past nine years. At the same time, she was working to complete her PhD and using the college's tuition reimbursement to assist with some of the fees. She decided to move on to a new position elsewhere and was told via email 
she would owe approximately $4,000 to reimburse the college for their tuition reimbursement payments. They informed her via email she needed to work there for three years after each payment in order to earn it. My wife asked to see where she had ever agreed to this in writing, and there was silence. No email response was received. On her official last day, she met with HR, and at the end of the meeting, the HR rep admitted they had never followed any of their tuition reimbursement procedures with my wife and none of the paperwork that was supposed to be completed, including informing my wife of the three-year policy and her acceptance of it, had ever been presented to her. The HR rep said, You'll receive an invoice for about $4,000 in the mail one day. What you do with it is up to you. So this is really more of a thank God I asked them to present me with the contract moment than what was requested, but I think it's in the ballpark of what's being asked. Story 45. Was trying to buy a used car. I researched how to do it since I had never purchased a car before. Prevailing advice was to walk in with your own financing. Find a car that I liked after several weeks of shopping. I had already notified them of my pre-approved financing, and they began running the finance paperwork. I realized as they start pushing things for me to sign that the APR was like seven points higher than what I walked in with and started asking questions. They tried to say it was because they couldn't get a hold of my financial institution of choice, but it was okay because I was approved by so many of theirs. I was suspicious and I took the other advice I had read about car shopping. Don't be afraid to walk. I had run out of time before needing to be at work anyway, so it was good timing in that respect. During some downtime at work, I got calls from the dealer saying they got a hold of my lender. Weird since I was trying to call the lender I'd chosen and got nothing. It then dawned on me after listening to the message system that I wasn't getting a hold of anyone because it was a bank holiday. That being the case, how is it that this car dealer had gone through back channels to presumably get a hold of them or anyone else? Fishy. The following morning I called the lender. They said they had been closed so there was no back channel access. Since they had approved the dealer as someone they would do business with, they told me the dealer had to honor what they, the lender, offered to me. And if they didn't, there would be follow-up with QA. I was given a phone number to call in case the dealer continued to try its funny business with me. I told my story to a guy that used to work at a dealership, and he asked if anyone was celebrating and high-fiving me as I was leaving with my car. Nah, they were pretty bland. He then told me that means I got a good deal. No one was celebrating because I read the contract and made sure they honored the pre-approved deal with my lender thus meaning they weren't getting seven points extra on the back end. Story 46. I was buying my first apartment. The ad said $350K for three bedrooms and free body corporate for a year. Call the guy and he says it's actually two bedrooms and a study, and they'd get me to come to his office instead of seeing the place. I insist on seeing the apartment show up with my father the next week. It's one bedroom. The study wasn't its own room, but a piece of particle board he glued to the wall. Every time I asked where the remaining bedroom was, he dodged the question. It was actually $100K more than he said it was, and my father got him to admit that the body corporate wouldn't be free either. The entire thing was a con job built to trick first home buyers into purchasing overpriced new apartments because the developers couldn't sell them normally and needed to at least make their money back. Last I checked, they're still trying to sell then two years later and haven't changed the incorrect ad. It was a pretty obvious con, but we don't get a lot of actual, I'm going to screw up your entire life on purpose con artists around here. Story 47. Two years ago, I went to get a new phone and plan that required a contract. The guy was like, hey, this plan comes with a free tablet. You just need to add the data coverage for it. I thought, awesome. Free stuff? Then excuse myself to look at the tablet in question. They were selling them for $100 without the plan. I came back and asked how much the coverage was per month. $10 per month for a year. Then I could drop the coverage with no penalty. Noped the fudge out of that deal. Edit. Data coverage was just for one gig per month. I forgot to include that. 